Hello and welcome to the 212 people that we have online who have joined us for tonight's webinar and the viewers who will be watching the podcast. The Mental Health Professional Network wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay respect to the Elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. Hi, I'm Rachel Rossiter and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. My clinical background is one in psychotherapy and in community mental health, but my current role is largely as Associate Professor of Nursing at Charles Sturt University. I'm now going to introduce our panellists. And I'd like to start by introducing Dr. Paul Grimsey, a rural GP who works in Romsey, Victoria. Paul has an interest in addiction medicine and mental health and is part of the RACGP Special Interest Addiction Network and Chair of the RACGP Victorian Drug and Alcohol Committee. He is also a medical educator. Paul. Can I ask you, how often do you see patients who present with gambling problems as their main concern? Thanks, Rachel. Um, it's actually a really interesting question. I, I had prepared my answer, or I thought about this and I thought, well, it's actually quite rare, but I um, had my first patient in many, many months present um, directly with this on Monday. So um, I, um, I've got a slightly skewed um, response to this. But in general, it, it's a, despite the prevalence of gambling disorders in our community, it's actually quite a representation for GPs to, to see. Um, I suppose there's two categories of presentation. One is where um, the patient will come in, usually because of external um, issues. So that could be a, a family issue, uh, such as John and his wife, Melissa, um, bringing in um, we're basically encouraging him to seek help and uh, he's, he's attending. Um, or it could be a, a crisis with work or, or finances or debt, um, something just sort of triggered externally. It's, it's actually quite a rare occasion for someone to acknowledge their issues and come in directly um, presenting with that itself. And so the second presentation is often um, where it's hidden. And it's hidden um, because of a number of factors. Um, so. I think exploring, the, if you, knowing that as a GP, um, that you, you may get a presentation directly, but one of the things about um, the, um, the session, well, I suppose the presentation is you've got to consider they won't necessarily present directly to us, but um, okay. we're probably not yeah. exploring that. Yeah. 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 So we'll look forward to hearing from you as to um, much more detail about that. Let me now go on and introduce um, Dr. Sally Gainsbury. Sally is a clinical psychologist with over 10 years experience in gambling research. Sally, your research has focused on understanding gambling to inform the development of responsible gambling strategies and harm minimisation policies. But I understand you've also completed research in some other areas. Can you tell us a little bit about those briefly? Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. I've been looking at internet gambling in particular recently because it is an area of increasing concern. I'm sure you've all seen uh, the proliferation of advertisements in relation to sporting events, advertising, online gambling websites, and we are seeing this as a new concern, particularly for young people in the community. The other area I've been looking at is uh, treatment. We now have online treatment options. We have treatment that's relevant for culturally and linguistically diverse populations. So it really isn't necessarily just a one fits all uh, in terms of treatment and prevention strategies. There is a lot of individual differences that we need to consider. Thank you, Sally. And it's great to know that there is a lot of research going on and such a diverse amount of research that's really um, practical as well. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Clive Alcock. Clive is a semi-working psychiatrist who has spent 35 years working with people with gambling problems. And his strong interest in horse racing from management through to breeding has um, given him a view of gambling from the other side. 
Clive, um, what are your thoughts about the Caulfield Club and how did you get involved with helping people with gambling problems? Uh, it's one of my sins, I got involved with horses and then I discovered racing and racing has been a part of my life for, uh, dare I say, for, for over 50 years, significantly over 50 years. I've been lucky enough to be involved and with a couple of good horses, particularly in the 80s. But my colleagues in psychiatry, as I moved into that field, knowing this interest in gambling, started sending me people with gambling problems because they presumed I knew something about it. And they were completely wrong. I, I knew a little bit about gambling, but not a lot about problem gambling, which of course at the time was very much under-noticed and, and under-researched issue. Um, I realized that there was a need, and I began commencing to do research and to assist problem gamblers, um, as you noted, know, for, for over 35 years. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to talk about some of the experiences and maybe pass on some of the information that I've gained. With regard to the Caulfield Cup, I have to step up and say it's been a lousy race for me over the years, and I will name a couple of horses, but I should apologise in advance to the connections of the horses for daring to name them. Um, the Borough horses are a bit of a challenge, and I do think the favourite Jamaica is a good chance, and one at a bit of value on each way basis is a horse called Tally. It'll need a bit of luck from a wide barrier draw. But Rachel and everybody listening, gamble responsibly. Thank you, Clive. And um, I guess take those tips at your own risk. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, and finally I'd like to welcome um, Ms. Kate Roberts. And Kate is an Australian Association of Social Work accredited mental health social worker for over 34 years and an accredited problem gambling counsellor. Kate has worked for the past 17 years in the field of problem gambling. She was the founding chairperson of the Gambling Impact Society for New South Wales and now works as their executive officer. She's a community advocate and lobbies at both a state and national level to raise awareness. Kate, you have a special or a particular interest in, pub in a public health approach to gambling. Can you tell us about how that relates to your PhD research? Oh, thank you, yes. Um, well, I've had a range of journeys with um, gambling issues and gambling harms and um, currently um, looking at uh, the nature of um, poker machine gambling in particular and um, the way that uh, it perhaps undermines agency um, and rebounds people into a new relationship with technology are very much based on some of the work of Donna Haraway and uh, the concept of cyborg. And, uh, Recently, we've seen a very good ABC documentary could thing that um, perhaps reinforced that in lay people's terms. And I'm interested in how we uh, use that knowledge now in um, developing policies that uh, look at both the harm for individuals, um, families, but also communities. And um, I guess that's part of my interest in the whole field of gambling, um, not just at an individual clinical level but also um, with family members and uh, communities and very much a systemic approach. Okay, thank you Kate and um, we'll look forward to um, reading your the findings from your research in due course. Mm, thank you. Okay, so before we go any further, I'd just like to remind you of the ground rules to make sure that we all have the opportunity to gain the most from the live webinar. We ask that every participant consider the following rules. Be respectful of other participants and panellists. Behave as if, as if this were a face-to-face -face activity. Please post your comments and questions for panellists in the general chat box. If you are having technical issues, post in the technical help chat box. Be mindful that comments posted in the chat boxes can be seen by all participants and panellists and please keep your comments on topic. If you'd like to hide the chat, click the small down arrow at the top of the chat box. Remember your feedback is important to us, so we'd ask that you please complete the short exit survey, which will appear as a pop-up when you exit the webinar. Just very briefly, this interdisciplinary panel discussion is focused on giving you the opportunity to do at the end to describe how to engage with people who are experiencing problem gambling, to implement key principles of providing an integrated approach in the early identification 
and treatment of mental health problems related to problem gambling, and to identify challenges, tips and strategies in providing a collaborative response to assisting people experiencing mental health issues related to problem gambling. Now I'm going to make an assumption that you've all read the case study as it was um, posted for you and hand over now to um, Paul to hear his perspective as a GP and his response to this particular case study. Thank you, Paul. Excellent. Thanks, Rachel. Um, in preparing this component, which is from a very much a GP perspective, I really have to focus on my role as a GP uh, and being a generalist in primary care rather than my focus which is a special interest in addiction. So um, really this is a GP focused thing and utilising a little bit of my experience, but um, again, just making sure it's, it's very general. And um, as I mentioned in sort of my introduction, the, the, the presentation of patients like John, um, or patients with problem gambling do vary, and John's presentation is not um, really out of the blue. It, it's something that's quite common um, in terms of having that external factor um, bringing someone like John into the uh, issue. but And I suppose one of the things that holds people back from presenting themselves, and we know a lot of people do not present um, on their own um, volition, is the issue of stigma. And it's the stigma is across the board with a lot of mental health. And with problem gambling, it seems to be magnified. There's a particular issue, uh, um, or association between the gambling behaviours and the feeling of shame and that shame will hold people back in seeking help and uh, it makes it very difficult for those um, people and their families to, um, to bring this up to external people such as, such as their GP despite um, uh, our efforts to try and make the consultations as open as possible. So there are a number of things we can do as a GP to try and facilitate this. And to some extent uh, I approach someone like John as this is the first presentation of hopefully a long-term relationship. Um, so I'm not going to focus just on the gambling, and I may even put it to a side for a moment, um, but I'm really going to focus on, on him as a person. Now, the important part about being a GP is to ensure that things such as um, what we're discussing clinically remains as confidential as, as possible. And there are only a few exceptions, and in this case, there's nothing flagging uh, danger to his own life or someone else's, although we would need to assess that as part of our assessment. So I could reassure him that uh, in discussing things, um, things are going to be confidential. Probably the first thing I would do is actually thank John for coming in I, and, and, and potentially if he looked, it depends on how his expression was, I'd probably um, acknowledge how brave it is to actually make that first step. That first step in seeking help, even if it's been pushed by someone else, is really um, a gutsy move and uh, you know, while his wife is um, asking to seek help and made the appointment, he didn't have to turn up. So just acknowledging that effort's really important to help start developing that engagement very early. We've got a short consultation time with, with someone like John uh, as we have with a lot of patients in general practice. So we've got to make the most of this and really getting that engagement very early. So acknowledging any discomfort he may be experiencing, reassuring him that it's okay to talk about this here um, and also I suppose re-emphasising the idea of um, confidentiality. We know a lot of males don't seek uh, general practitioner uh, health care and often uh, what we consider often until, until it's too late until we've actually got real um, big issues that are symptomatic to them. So. Um, they may not be familiar with the health environment within the dual practice setting, so reinforcing that confidentiality is important. In terms of asking him about um, the gambling side of things, I think it's, it's worth having a few leading um, statements beforehand. So a normalising statement I find is quite useful, and I often say, look, one of the normal things, one of the things I do with my, most of my patients is ask a few questions about their lifestyle, and I may ask about smoking, about exercise, nutrition, uh, other drugs. And as part of that lifestyle assessment, then I'll throw in, I also you know, ask patients about um, whether they've had any problems with gambling. Um, it's nice to anchor sometimes this with a patient um, who doesn't present with a gambling issue. And John's an exception in this case, but someone may be presenting with other issues. So if, if you're asking about mental health issues, um, men's health issues, drug and alcohol, other substance issues, or even just during a taking of social history, it's a nice anchor then to bounce off saying a lot of people who have um, you know, having trouble with their work or finding things stressful, um, but in terms of gambling, have you ever had this sort of problem? So anchoring it to part of the presentation would be quite useful in terms of leading into this area, so it doesn't seem like a question out of the blue if they're not presenting with it directly. In John's case, we've got he's already let in, 
but I think it's important for GPs to be able to screen for this as regularly as we can. We can't screen for every possible problem, every consultation, but there are certain um, factors that will lead us to um, that more so. And so those things are mental health issues, and particularly, we know um, the high prevalence stuff, depression and anxiety are closely associated with the high correlation between uh, problem gambling and those mental health issues. Um, social issues, and that could be marital problems, it can be problems with isolation socially, it can be uh, workplace. So that social history that we do take, especially when we're seeing a patient for the first time, can be an important clue um, for us to enter uh, and inquire about problem gambling. The other thing um, that's uh, closely associated with it and associated with all these things is substance use. Um, we know a lot of people who um, drink alcohol to excess or use other drugs to excess or smoke to, or not to excess, just smoke full stop, um, have uh, a higher rate of problem gambling and vice versa. So they're all options for us to get in there and so it's really a matter of you know, choosing the right sort of question. The question I would suggest, if, you, if there's lots of ways of doing this, but just ask one question, have you ever had an issue with gambling? Uh, it's quite a direct question, it's simple and it's actually quite got good uh, validity in exploring, uh, an opening question to start this. So once you've got an opening and someone's acknowledging maybe they've got an uh, area with gambling, then it's important to reassess those other areas. So whether they, you know, if they've got gambling as a primary problem that you're addressing now, then look further into um, those other areas that I've just mentioned. So it goes back and forth and it's important for us to assess that broadly. While remaining, remaining non-judgmental, really opening up the discussion and allowing, giving John permission to talk about these things in his own time. Our real role though as GPs in this area is really coordinating a team. And it's really essential for us to set the, um, the stage where John feels comfortable with coming back to us, um, but we also make sure that we're well supported in ourselves. It's not an area that most GPs are familiar with. So we should have a role in looking after the medical part of him. You know, um, he's a 42 year old male. He should be um, sort of having a middle aged men's health check, with cardiovascular risk in particular, diabetes assessments, uh, drug and alcohol lifestyle assessments. And we should also be incorporating other services. Um, so someone like a psychologist um, would be the ideal first person that I would be looking at if John was willing to engage within this first consult, but it may not come in the first consult. So on that note, I'm going to um, just sign off for this. And uh, having mentioned psychologist, I think Rachel, you've got someone else to introduce. Okay. Thank you, um, Paul. You gave us a, a lightning trip through um, the GP's um, role and perspective. And as you suggest, we're going to now hear from Sally, who's going to give us the perspective from a psychologist. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. So just kicking off, as uh, to follow on from Paul, I, as a psychologist, a clinical psychologist, would receive a referral from a GP outlining the client's presenting problem. And from this uh, case study, it would seem as though that gambling is a central issue to be discussed. So here you can see the gambling disorder criteria. So gambling disorder is classified as behavioural addiction, similar to substance use in the DSM-5. Uh, this location reflects the research findings that gambling disorder is similar to substance related disorders in the clinical expression, brain origin, comorbidity, physiology and treatment as substance related disorders. The symptoms you can see there, so I won't go through, but it's important to note, unlike substance abuse, there are no visible signs of gambling problems. You can't see it in someone's eyes or smell it on their breath. Gambling is often referred to as the hidden addiction. So clinicians uh, can look for signs and patterns of disengaging with relationships and not being so concerned with other important things in their lives. Change patterns of recreation, of eating, sleeping, mood changes, financial difficulties or sudden spending. And then unexplained absences because gambling does take up a lot of time. So in our first client meeting, as Paul said, you'd really assess the issue, but there'd be a lot of motivation going on. There's a lot of embarrassment and shame associated with gambling and gambling problems. And particularly within specific cultures, this can be enhanced. Uh, in minority cultures, we do see uh, particularly difficulties with discussing gambling problems that's associated, for example, with a, a loss of faith in Asian cultures. So the first session would typically be spent doing a thorough assessment with the client and motivating the client to ensure they're able to begin the process of change and recovery. As with other addictions, gambling problems typically follow a cycle of increasing intensity of engagement, attempts to stop and relapse. So it's about assessing of where someone is in that cycle. 
But recovery also means different things to different people. So it's important to assess whether the goal is abstinence uh, from gambling completely, abstinence from some forms of controlled use. And this can also change over the course of treatment. So what we might look at is uh, expressing empathy, being very respectful and compassionate, uh, helping the client see the consequences of their gambling. So creating a discrepancy between continuing gambling and achieving important goals. You would avoid any arguments and really roll with any resistance so that the client themselves can identify their own solutions. Uh, gambling, there is no single conceptual model, but it's the pathway model is proposed that uh, takes into account that not everyone who has a gambling problem displays it uh, in the same way or develops it in the same way. So what we call is the pathway one on normal problem gamblers are those who enter into gambling problems are linked to environmental or learning, might stem from cognitive distortions, uh, the gambler doesn't necessarily have any pre-existing psychological problems. Then there's a second pathway of what we call emotionally vulnerable gamblers who uh, might be using gambling as a way to manage stress or crisis in their lives. And that's what we might see in this case here. And then the third biologically based pathway are those who have multiple disorders and um, more seriously entrenched gambling problems such as impulse control difficulty. Problem of gambling affects people in different ways and it doesn't uh, discriminate. So gambling problems are found across uh, age groups, income groups, cultures and jobs. Some people develop gambling problems quickly or some develop them over years. Uh, finally, just briefly, treatment. The most effective treatment we know is uh, CBT and motivational interviewing components, uh, although there isn't a lot of research on gambling treatment in the different types. But uh, we also know that people can benefit from brief interventions. Even a single session intervention can be really effective for some people. So uh, motivational interviewing is an important component. You'd also look at uh, a thorough assessment to see what else is going on in their life. Psychoeducation is important, and that's about understanding how, for example, poker machines work, understanding randomness, and common irrational beliefs. Then you look at behavioural strategies, so for example you might self-exclude from a venue, leave your cash at home, uh, avoid visiting places to drink yeah, that have gambling venues, uh, looking at cognitive challenging and realistic thinking about gambling, desensitising cues to gambling, so in, in our Australian society we, there's a lot of cues to gamble which might be uh, visiting a pub with some friends where there are poker machines, it might be seeing ads during sporting matches for internet gambling, simply having funds available, uh, cash in your hand, and so being able to teach people how to avoid those urges. And then to look at coping with negative emotions, which might be an, another outlet for dealing with stress, anxiety and depression, behavioural as well as cognitive strategies, and this might be dealing with things that are precursors to gambling as well as emotions that have arisen as in relation to gambling problems. Expanding and working on other problems in the larger context, and then importantly, relapse prevention. So that's a very brief outline of the typical things that you might look at in treatment, but again that you can uh, do a lot in just a single session and there are also now a lot of uh, online self-help tools that individuals can use to help themselves. I'm happy to discuss those more later on. Thanks Rachel. Okay, so thank you Sally. And we've had the psychologist perspective, but I gather from what Clive's already told us, it's not uncommon for people with gambling problems to be referred to as a psychiatrist. And um, Clive, we'd like to hear from you now as to your perspective on what you'd be thinking about when you look at um, the gentleman in our case study today, John. Oh, thank you, Rachel. I think it's a very difficult call sometimes for a general practitioner to know who to refer and when to refer, and I think that's an issue that some folks in the audience might want to raise some questions about. When I started out, there were virtually no services. There was Gamblers Anonymous, and there were a few people like myself. Um, they, then, with funding, they gained a lot of training, and we have now a, a very good number of psychologists and other counsellors who are involved and can be referred to through the various uh, services in, in the different states. Not a lot of psychiatrists um, have a particular interest, but increasingly that number is growing. And the useful role is if um, Paul, for example, in assessing John, is just a bit worried. He said it's a shortish session. He's, I'm sure he's taking a very thorough history, but he feels there could be a bit more going on. He'd like to get uh, an observation, particularly around depression, whether there's a need for medication. So he makes the referral. Now, I'd just like to make the point that 
at one stage in my life, I was running a private clinic and I was running a public clinic for gamblers. And obviously, with the general practitioner referrals to my private clinic, sometimes in good faith, the general practitioners would have prescribed a depressant, an antidepressant, because they clearly think the person has come through the door and they said, I'm feeling rather sad, I'm feeling rather low. Um, and so a prescription is handed over. What intrigued me, because there's always about a two to maybe even six week waiting list before they saw me, is how many people had either not taken the tablet or had taken the tablet but then stopped because they didn't like some of the side effects. One of the main reasons was that quite often having that first appointment and then maybe having a second appointment with a psychiatrist lifted the mood enormously. Uh, and so I think it's important to make a difference between people feeling understandably unhappy about their situation and a serious depression, which will have some of the biological signs, early morning wakening, weight loss, even so to much, so to much retardation, um, to decide whether I'm not going to necessarily leap straight in and provide a prescription and get people started on medication. Um, we know that around about 60% of people presenting will meet the criteria for depression, but sometimes those criteria are a little vague and they don't take into account the normal reaction of sadness. Quite frankly, as a clinician, I used to get a little worried sometimes when people weren't unhappy with their situation, and I found over time that those were the people who didn't do as well as those who were unhappy and were motivated. So the first call would be to just wait and not immediately think about an antidepressant. Now, uh, if it is needed, what is the right sort? Well, the older tricyclics, I don't think, have shown any benefit. There are some studies suggesting some of the more modern uh, serotonin, selective reuptake inhibitors, the, uh, the noradrenaline and serotonin reuptake inhibitors may help if there's a serious depression that does require medication. A couple of caveats there. Um, one of them has been methaxine or effexor. Uh, at high doses, is actually also a dopamine reuptake inhibitor and has been associated with problem gambling. And another drug to bear in mind is if you're uh, also treating somebody for Parkinson's disease, some of the medications have been associated with an increase or a creation of a problem gambling situation. And something like 7% of people on those medications may have a problem that is contributed to significantly, if not totally caused by, uh, their anti-Parkinson medication. And those are issues that have to be juggled around. One of the things that also happened in more recent times was that everybody's reading Dr. Google these days, and I would have some people come in and say, Doc, I want to be put on naltrexone, which is an opioid antagonist, and Paul would know a lot about that in terms of its role in, in helping people with uh, alcohol and drug issues. The problem is that it's not available specifically for gambling. Uh, if you can find an alcohol problem and you think there's a case for it, uh, it can be considered. But in my view, the research around naltrexone is not yet convincing that it's, it's something to be considered semi-automatically for almost every gambler. Uh, if there is a family history of uh, alcohol, and if there is a current history of alcohol, there may be a subgroup within the whole group of problem gamblers who will actually specifically benefit from the naltrexone. But it, it's something to bear in mind. Um, I think the studies are a bit questionable uh, because they use very high doses of naltrexone. Uh, they were for a short period of time, about three months, and, and there was a high placebo response. But you will find in the field, if you're in the medication side of things, uh, that some patients will talk to you about that and uh, maybe it's worth um, considering, but not automatically. I'd be happy to return to either of those issues in the question and answer. I just want to have a quick look uh, to close out on the question of other diagnoses. We've talked about depression and anxiety. As I said, some of that can be understandable, but at the extreme, it may be something that does require treatment. Uh, alcohol and drugs are very much associated. Probably 20% of people with a gambling problem will also have an alcohol problem. Possibly about 10% will also have a problem with drugs. One of the, uh, I guess, slightly forgotten issues, and it's popping up a bit more in consideration these days, is the question of the personality component. Um, and there are suggestions now that there are a, a range of factors that can contribute to making a person vulnerable to problem gambling because the reality is the majority of people gamble, the majority do not have a problem. So what tries to separate out those people uh, into the different groups of those who do have a problem? And antisocial traits, uh, certainly narcissistic traits in young people, and OCD uh, may have a factor with some people. I note that uh, John has been accounted, there might have been some uh, obsessive compulsive traits there which have been assisting him in his career. Perhaps one of the stresses is that he's now been given so much work that with his temperament um, he's not able to handle that and he's turned to booze and then to gambling as a way of dealing with it. 
Uh, bipolar, you note that I put two ahead of one. Some people have argued that the swings of the bipolar disorder uh, that is not quite bipolar one with the extreme mania and the extreme depression, uh, that's a contributing factor. It's a diagnosis of some contention. But I have seen some people with bipolar one who in a manic episode have gone off and gambled a lot. Um, and clearly the treatment of the bipolar disorder is important. And I thought to mention schizophrenia in passing because while you very rarely have somebody who has a delusional system that leads to their gambling, uh, perhaps the prime example is I had a gentleman who was quite convinced he'd been working for ASIO, but because he'd been spying for ASIO, the only way he could get paid was to receive 30000 through the poker machines. And of course, he was playing the poker machines in order to allow the 30000 to come his way. And it never did, and he lost considerably more than that over time. But that sort of delusional pattern is rare. Most of the people who have schizophrenia and who have a problem with gambling uh, do so because they're bored. And if you're on a, a DSP and you're wondering how to fill in your days, gambling can easily take a hold and provide you with uh, some entertainment, um, some time filling, but also some major cost factors uh, as well in your lifestyle. Now, I think I'll leave it at that point. And as I said, I'm, I'm very much open to any questions that people might want to raise in the question and answer. And uh, hand it back to you, Rachel. Thank you, Clive. And um, finally, let's hear from Kate and hear your perspective as a social worker and working with individuals and families. Thanks, oh, Kate. Thank you, Rachel. Yes. Um, well, I guess um, as a specialist in the gambling field, there are quite a lot of overlaps, and we certainly do look at the psychological interventions that Sally has been talking around. Um, but obviously, um, for this, um, presentation I wanted to concentrate on some of the other areas that we would touch on. So I've really um, taken this from the public health perspective which is a strong passion of mine and um, just really putting up that framework um, uh, drawn from the Productivity Commission report in 1999 when we first looked into gambling industries in Australia and really looking at the gambling uh, individual characteristics and behaviour are only part of the story there and I won't go through it all but we're really looking like many other public health issues such as alcohol, tobacco control, um, etc., that um, there are a whole conglomerate um, arrangements around how gambling is offered in the community and therefore how that also contributes to gambling harm. So when we come to look at the individual who is presented to a service such as mine, um, usually that contact happens over the phone and, um, and, and therefore we've already had that discussion. But in that first session, I guess um, the reason why I'm interested in the public health perspective is also to be able to convey that to the client. We've talked about the amount of stigma and shame that people who have developed a gambling problem are often come into treatment with that very clear uh, perspective that they are flawed individuals. And uh, I guess part of my approach in normalising that is, is starting to look at those systemic aspects of the offerings in the community and how that with that comes along a number of risks when we talk about what uh, we would call in public health products of dangerous consumption. And that really is aimed at helping to encourage a discussion that is uh, beyond um, just individual um, characteristics and seeing this in the context of a, of a bigger um, social system, if you like. And, and in doing that, try and help re reduce the stigma and shame and um, put things into context with the individual um, before we really start getting into obviously how that relates for him. So in terms of John, um, it would be the invitation to explore his individual story, his individual experiences of gambling and how does that fit with him socially, culturally and spiritually and, and how does he experience the harms from gambling and really how did this develop in his life. So very much a listening the poor building exercise because people are often at a point of um, almost like a pressure cooker coming into uh, a treatment and in some respects it's a great relief to be able to start really talking about the reality of this. And then through that process obviously we're going to be assessing the extent of the gambling behaviour, there's a number of screens that I've put up that are common in clinical use and discussing with John just how that has developed for him. And along with that, um, we know that uh, gambling problems can also um, have significant suicide risks. I think one in five we're finding in the alphas uh, in, in suicidal um, presentations there. So it's very important to assess the client's safety and to also start looking at those comorbid 
conditions. We talk about depression and anxiety often going hand in hand, and also other stress-related disorders. So again, a, a number of screening tools. I mean, generally, a first um, session, people when they make contact, we expect people to put aside at least an hour, if not an hour and a half, for this kind of um, initial assessment and, and, and discussion. Um, and one of the things I like to do with clients is to introduce um, what we call a psycho problem gamut, which is a model to sort of explore um, whether this fits with their perception. And often for clients, it can be a, a way of just getting a picture of what's been going on for them. And uh, this is a very common model that was developed a, a good few years ago now. But it really tries to help explain uh, what the person may have been directly experiencing in terms of the the drivers to gamble, um, the patterns of developing the chasing behaviour, which does become so destructive, and then um, the sense of how that can then just get into this vicious cycle, um, and then gets clouded around with ways of shifting the world a little bit so that we're not actually facing up to that. It's very difficult when you become involved in gambling, something that appears quite social and entertainment-wise becomes a growing problem. And sometimes it's really hard to discern when it has become a problem. And I find this model helps people start to just identify that and we can talk about where we can um, help people put in the brakes on that if they're interested in, in looking at that harm minimization approach. And so it's very much building rapport with John, exploring his perspective on gambling, what have been the benefits, but also what have been the costs in his life with this behaviour, what have been the impacts on himself, or what have been the impacts on Melissa and the children, and starting to get him to think a little bit about the cost benefits in that, and explore what his goals might be for change, what's actually brought him here, what's his expectations of therapy, what would um, a change look like, for him, um, again, a bit of a solution-focused approach there, starting to build a picture and some difference uh, from what he's experiencing at the moment, uh, without obviously um, sweeping aside that he's obviously in a very stressed situation and very much acknowledging uh, what may be some of the challenges that are currently going on in his life and uh, some immediate self-help strategies there. And, um, and within that, often exploring the model of change uh, people may be familiar with that and, and helping him see where, you know, discuss where he sees himself in that model and giving the concept of hope that there are possibilities of change, but it's not a, that's a quick fix. It's something that people uh, take some time and they may move within and, and around that model. But really, again, normalising the recovery process, helping um, John understand that this is a process and this is really, you know, again, as uh, Paul was saying, acknowledging the first step that he's made to come and um, seek some support and develop some open discussion around some immediate practical strategies to reduce harm for the immediate um, period, that may be next week, next month, uh, looking at some self-help strategies around cash management, um, what are the immediate sort of triggers and risks, um, and maybe introduce at this stage the notion of self-exclusion, which is a process where people can actually ban themselves from a the venue. Um, and then, of course, explore more broadly what his expectations are for ongoing support, and also not only for him, but for Melissa, his wife, and his family in, in all, and um, whether they would be open to some couple therapy or some individual and ongoing therapy, and what might be the mix in that. And certainly, I've been very used to working with um, people who come up in an individual basis, but the invitations then to the partner and then working out with the couple how they may want to move forward with that. Um, so really starting to invite some ongoing work um, and then really discuss how John would like to see that develop, what other practical supports he may need, what other referrals he may need, and, um, and along with that, uh, that may include some additional resources for him to take home. Uh, there's a number of um, supports here that I've listed um, informational resources and also practical resources. Um, and also telling him about the 24-hour uh, counselling support, uh, the crisis sort of help that's available between sessions or independent of sessions, the online services, local support groups. And then there's a number of um, consumer-based resources. And on the Gambling Impact Society, we have some personal stories up there that people can sort of again explore other people's experiences. So again, trying to help him see that um, 
you know, that whilst this is, it has become a, a major issue in his life for him to have taken a step to come forward with the ball, um, that he's obviously not alone in this. There are many opportunities to help him move through and that this is the beginning of the journey. So I'm happy to talk some of those things as we progress. Rachel. Okay, thank you, Kate. And thank you for the resources. Can I just remind um, participants that in the folder, um, there's also some additional resources and information there for you. I'd um, like now as we we'll proceed to questions, and uh, I thought that um, we might start, Paul, I'd start by asking you, what do you do? What happens when you, you've got someone who has a gambling problem and you suggest to them that, that you refer them to see someone else? What are you going to do or what should you do? What works when they say, no, nope, not going, I only want to see you? Not hearing Paul at this stage. Sorry, Paul, you've just muted yourself. Sorry about that. I'll, um, can you hear me now? I'm assuming that's okay. Um, it, it's a good question. I have um, we encounter this quite regularly, actually. Uh, yeah, if you're a psychologist listening to this, you probably only get to see the once the referrals happen. There's a lot of work um, that often doesn't get to uh, uh, a secondary. Um, health professional and GPs take a lot of the, the workload on themselves either through decisions personally to enjoy that work or um, often very commonly because the patient uh, wants to retain within the GP um, setting only. I suppose there's two main factors with that. One is again coming back to the area of shame and not wanting to share this and really uh, there's a lot of barrier in, in disclosing to one person let alone another person. Another one is once you've given someone like your GP a very personal account of how you're struggling with things, um, there is a, a bond and an empathy within that consultation and they can feel a very therapeutic need. Um, so often they don't want to go anywhere else. What do, you, what do we do with that situation? Uh, it's a good question. I think the important part of our session is general practitioner, we're generalists. Um, so we, we won't be um, anywhere near as good as a psychologist or a physiotherapist or a financial counsellor or a surgeon or a psychiatrist or whatever the needs are, but we have little skills in all those areas and we've really got to utilise those. A lot of the time it takes time, so it's really just sitting with the patient, utilising what skills you can do. It may be just simple strategy settings like um, Sally mentioned, just how to avoid situations where they're likely to um, gamble, um, at the financial controls within the family system, problem solving sort of approaches, but it really is about engaging the patient longer term and often patients who see themselves not improving um, despite that help will eventually um, be open to, to that, but it takes a lot of time. So it's really about engaging your patient long term as I mentioned at the start and hopefully they'll come to the party. Um, and I actually find Sometimes even with that long-term thing, I don't may, may, feel, may not feel I'm actually being actively very helpful, um, but just that presence and continuity with the healthcare professional who's willing to listen actually makes a difference and patients make their own changes without actually being actively pushed in that direction. Thanks, Paul. I noticed that um, some of the questions have been around suicide and I wondered if um, people from the panel could um, comment on this. Kate, you um, identified the importance of assessing for risk of suicide. I wonder if there, is, there are any statistics on the proportion of, of gamblers who do complete suicide. Do you want me to talk to that? Whoever would like to, yes. Um, the difficulty is that there's not a lot of reporting by coroners. Um, although I think it was maybe two years ago that Victoria, a study over a decade, had 128 cases. Um, certainly when the Productivity Commission in, two, in 1999, they were recording 2,900 suicide attempts uh, for gambling and uh, again the numbers seem quite low. But based on the research out of the Alfred's Mental Health Unit that was uh, asking specific questions around gambling and suicidal attempts. 
Um, and as I said, around about one in five, so um, somewhere around 17.5% to 20% is estimated, which works out roughly at about 400 people a year that is estimated that uh, are likely to be completing suicides related to gambling problems. And of course, let's also uh, remember that this isn't just the person who has developed the gambling problem. Uh, around about 85% spouses consider that they have a serious uh, health issue in relation to living with someone with a gambling problem, and they are equally at risk of suicide. So thanks, Kate. We can see that this is really a, um, a significant issue in our community. And um, I, I guess that given that we've got a, a team here with multiple a multidisciplinary team, I'd like to hear some comments from the panel as to how you think we can work together most effectively. Um, we've all brought our We've brought your specific expertise, but how do you collaborate together most effectively? Rachel, can I start? Mm, please. Yeah, um, I suppose one of the key roles of a GP is to be both the gatekeeper to other services so that we're using our resources appropriately, but also the coordinator of those services. And I think one of the areas that can be very good, but also poor in some areas and with certain practitioners on both sides of the equation is the communication. Um, some referrals are very thin and some reports back either are non-existent or very thin as well. So if we really foster that communication, um, we can actually see we're on the same page. I've actually got a question for Sally um, regarding this thing. When you're seeing a patient, is there anything that I, as a GP, can do in my consultations when I'm reviewing the patient that would help reinforce or, or cement some of the work you're doing? Or is there anything that GPs do to undermine potentially the work you're doing inadvertently. Um, how can we work better, even if we're not communicating on a, a, such a regular basis as it would be ideal? Thanks, Paul. That's a great question. And I think gambling certainly is a type of issue that can be dealt really effectively with in uh, a step care approach. Because gambling issues are related to such a broad variety of things, you have uh, clients presenting with obviously the, the gambling related issues, there's financial difficulties, there's family issues that Kate's spoken about, uh, there's comorbid issues. So often someone with gambling problems will need to see a range of uh, professionals, including health uh, and otherwise. So it is really important that we do communicate. So with a GP, someone can actually uh, have a GP and a psychologist. They could also have a GP help them as they get support online using some of the online resources like Gambling Help Online where they can have online counselling. They can actually work through a, a sort of a self-help program of gambling and using resources and try some strategies themselves and then report back to their GP for more general support and to talk through those strategies. So that's one really effective way uh, for GPs to assist our uh, people with gambling problems. But then also that communication, for example, uh, dealing with, I suppose, the most uh, disruptive issues first. And then taking a step back and saying, well, well, now we also need to deal with the wider issue. You know, what's going on that's causing stress or anxiety or depression? How can we uh, learn how to deal with those broader strategies? So really gambling is something that affects such a, a broad range of issues and, and the people around you. We also see people not just with their gambling problems, but their family members themselves, as, as Kate said. So I think communication uh, across the whole sort of team, if you will, of people who are helping someone I work through gambling related issues, whether it be their, their own or their family and loved ones, is really important to have that uh, consistent care that someone does need. Thanks, um, Sally. That um, really helps to reinforce what can be helpful. And uh, I guess, um, Kate, one of the things that, you know, from your perspective is um, working with families. If I have a family member who is gambling, um, how can I help and how as a clinician can I help that family member to support the, the problem gambler? Because I suspect that often the things that family members attempt to do can make things worse. Can you help us with that one, Kate? Um, 
Yes, look, I think uh, generally, and I, I've been working now with the University of Bath and Birmingham on a program called the Five to Pet Program for family members of people with drug, alcohol and gambling problems. And really the research that's come out of that is that um, we, we haven't done such a fantastic job in the past about working with family members in their own right. And that program is really about working with the person where they're at and, and without judgment, looking at how they are currently coping, very much listening to their side of the story and um, helping them develop that strategy for self-care and provide some very concrete information about the various disorders. Um, now, what that means in practice is that we do have a range of, uh, certainly in New South Wales, 50 very specific gambling health services. Uh, that provide counselling services through psychologists, through social workers, through other counsellors. And they are all open to family members. Unfortunately, the take-up isn't very large by family members. And I think that is an issue out in the community that uh, we need to regard this as very much a family systems affair. Um, family members uh, can be very crucial, in fact, in helping people uh, obtain uh, support and, in fact, many Times it is family members that come forward looking for support perhaps before the person themselves does so. So again, I come at this very much from a systemic approach and uh, if a family member comes to see me, then I will be working in both a psychoeducation and also at their own issues and looking at self-protections um, as well as how they might best respond to some of the issues that come up around various coping mechanisms some of which may be more constructive than others, but very much in a non-judgmental manner. But I'm also very interested, and in, and when I get that opportunity, to work with families as a whole. I've had rooms full of families, cousins, aunts, uncles, and the person themselves at times. Most often it is working with couples and um, working in a way where you're working both with individuals on their individual needs, but also then looking at the family and couple relationship in many respects is like having a third party in that relationship and helping that couple work um, around with this um, issue in their lives collaboratively. Thank you, Kate. Um, Sally, if um, we can come back to you and from your research perspective, the emphasis for all of us as healthcare professionals is on using evidence-based practice. Can you give us um, some ideas of what models of care we have evidence for, where, where we should start as the most effective um, treatment modality for problem gambling? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Rachel. It's actually, there is a fair, uh, not as much research as you would expect given how big a problem gambling is. I think in Australia, gambling really is recognised as a public health problem and it is included as an addictive disorder now, but we don't have as much treatment uh, research as we do in other addiction fields. We do know from the studies that have been done that the most uh, evident is for cognitive behavioural therapy as well as motivational interviewing, and these can often be combined. Uh, but at the same time, there's also evidence for a brief intervention. So we've seen in our research that even a single session can really be effective in motivating someone towards change. Uh, in terms of the different treatments, as you all know, across mental health treatments, you know, the therapist factor is very important. So having that rapport, whether it be with the GP or the therapist, that's really essential. And feeling really understood, particularly with something like problem gambling or disordered gambling, there's a lot of stigma, a lot of shame. So someone really needs to feel um, that it has to be a, a non-judgmental approach, compassion, to help someone motivate to uh, what we call the stages of change from you know, just thinking about changing to really being motivated to an action change and putting steps in because Ultimately, it is the individual themselves that has to implement change in their lives, whether it be using something like self-exclusion or uh, ch challenging their rational thoughts about gambling and understanding uh, the chances of winning. So we need a combination of approaches. Uh, cognitive behavioural therapy has the most support, motivation, interviewing, but also brief interventions. I think it's important to, for um, people who are 
potentially going to come in contact with someone with a gambling problem to not be sort of overwhelmed by how insurmountable some of the issues may seem and to, to break it down and just go step by step in helping someone along that road to recovery. And that's what the evidence does support that just uh, any intervention um, can really be helpful in having support for someone in a non-judgmental fashion. Okay, thanks um, Sally. So it's not just the intervention, is it? It's actually the, as always, the, the power of the relationships that can um, be a significant factor. Now um, Clive, we've lost his um, video, but he can still um, hear us and we will be able to hear him. And Clive, I, I wonder if you could um, comment. So the idea of actually chasing losses, I've lost something, lost a certain amount and I'm going on to, to see if I can get it back. How effective or how much impact or relevance do you think that that has in the causation, the maintenance and consequence of a gambling problem or disorder? Oh, thanks very much, Rachel. I, I guess um, having lost the camera is actually to everybody's advantage because it's getting a bit late in the night, so <laughs> you don't have to look at me. But look, I'd just like to back up Sally's comment as well because uh, quite a bit of research has shown that the therapeutic model is important, but the contact with the uh, therapist is, is really the crucial thing and maybe contributes to about 70% of the outcome. Uh, to revert back to chasing, uh, for those who are not familiar with the terminology, this means trying to win back what you've lost. And for most people who don't have a problem with gambling, they will accept that they've lost a little bit of money and they can live with that. Some days they might lose a bit more than they want to. But for people who are a bit vulnerable, for whatever reason, because they're down or they're depressed or they're overly confident about their ability to make money at their form of gambling, I believe that chasing is a very, very significant factor. And I think there are two reasons for that. Um, one is that um, there's a thing called negative recency. Now to explain what that is very briefly, this means that the belief is there that whatever has happened recently will change. To give you a good classic example, it was said in the 1930s there was a casino in South America where black came up 29 times in a row and that the sound of champagne corks popping was only matched by the sound of pistol shots. Of course this depends on whether you bet on to win or, or to continue or to stop. And the longer something goes on like that, black coming up, more and more people get persuaded there's going to be a change, and so they'll keep risking their money. The other relevant factor is a thing called, uh, from behavioral finance, is the, is the factor of the pain of a loss is felt twice as powerfully, if not more, than the joy of a win in the emotional circuits of the brain. Um, so nobody likes losing. And for somebody who's in a vulnerable state, um, they've come to gamble, they've hoped for some winning, some excitement, which is a factor as well, but that loss becomes very powerful and it hurts. And the only way you can get rid of that is, of course, by winning. And so you have the, the idea, I haven't had a winner for a while or the machine hasn't paid out for a while, uh, so therefore it's due or I'm due, and then you just keep going until the losses mount up. And then, of course, you get yourself into a financial situation. And very often, your only way out it is to hope for a win that comes along and you'll get that. So I think chasing is very important and needs to be explained as part of the cognitive therapy, how difficult it is. And people have to accept that what they've lost, they've lost. They're never going to get back. And if they go into gambling again, and it took me a few years to realize this sort of grief about loss, that it is there. If they go back to gambling to try and get it back, to try and restore their ego, to try and restore their finances, to try and restore the relationship, they're going to end up losing more and giving more money back. And I think as part of that, they need to say, I'm not going to give them any more and accept that what's gone is gone. But that's sometimes very easy to say and very hard to achieve. Can I, can I just talk to this from a public health perspective for a moment? Yes, thanks. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, um, we'll finish with I this. Yeah. I've also noticed a number of questions coming in about the incidence of gambling or the prevalence of gambling problems. And I guess um, Australia does have a high exposure of gambling in the community, and certainly there's been comments about the you know the amount of gambling that people may have the odd flush on the Melbourne Cup. That's really not what we see as the problem. And when we have in Australia $23 billion going, being lost on gambling and $11 billion of that coming from poker machines, then I think we also have to look at the product um, 
component in this in terms of chasing. Um, what we know is that there are certain design features within electronic gaming machines that are actually there to encourage people to believe that they're um, winning when in fact they are losing. And there has been quite a lot of studies done on the design features of machines that sort of suggest that um, it, this is actually not about human agency necessarily being independent from the machine. And that if you have a product that is specifically there um, helping you to develop false perceptions, then you can't really start saying that people are losing uh, their perceptions if they're specifically designed. And what we've known since 2001 through Mark Dickerson's um, work is that of people who play or gamble on electronic gaming machines once a week or more, 50% of them will develop some level of uh, problem with them just playing or gambling on the machine the way it is designed. So I think from that point of view, we have to also look at the product, just as we've done that with other products in the community, the level of harm cannot rest and responsibility cannot rest with just the individual. Thank you, Kate. And I think that we might actually um, take that message that you've just given us, Kate, as, as your um, message for us to take away that, um, that this is a multifactorial problem and that it requires um, a concerted approach across all, fact, all um, portions of the community, all parts of the community. And I'd like to invite the rest of the panel now, and we'll start with Paul, to just give us one key message that you'd like um, the participants to take away with them tonight about this topic. Thanks, Paul. I think the important thing for any GPs listening is that gambling is only one part of the patient, and really it's an opportunity to explore other parts, the comorbid parts, and really see this as an opportunity to engage a patient in the long term. With that therapeutic relationship, then we can actually address these issues. And we've got some crises to, to sort of settle down, but we've also got a long-term plan. So I think my key message here is don't lose hope with the small wins and losses. Play the long game um, and uh, don't bet on the long game. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Sally, can we um, hear from you now your um, message that you'd like the participants to take away with them? I think it's important to be in mind that we can all be part of the solution to addressing stigma about gambling problems. You know, there is no stereotype of someone that has a gambling problem. It really affects everybody across Australian society. There's no age or gender or particular cultural group uh, who uh, is immune to having gambling problems. So I think we need to use inclusive language. We need to normalise uh, seeking support, um, using prevention strategies, just like we put a seatbelt on in the car. We should normalise the fact of you know doing things like setting yourself a limit or leaving your ATM cards at home and and to increase the comfort that people do have of talking about gambling, of raising the issue, of putting their hand up uh, when they think only responding to crisis like coming to treatment. Thank you. Okay, Clive, the message that you'd like participants to take away from your perspective on this particular issue. Thank you. I think in a way that I would be echoing Paul and saying it's terribly important to ask about gambling. Uh, I used to give lectures in which I encourage people to take what I call a DAG history, drug, alcohol and gambling, because gambling is still very often forgotten, it's often not asked for. Um, it should be part of every interview by a GP, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, seeing somebody for the first time, trying to assess what's going on, even if a lot of the times you'll get a negative answer, at least you've asked, because sometimes you get a real surprise when it crops up. Um, it should be part of every hospital admission, particularly every emergency department assessment. It, it really is important to recognise that it's there and it is often under asked for. And if you don't ask for it, then people aren't going to offer it. As has been commented during the night, if you're drunk, you're drunk. If you're using drugs, you're using drugs and it becomes obvious. But gambling is very often hidden and often hidden from family members as well. So there's a need to keep be mindful of it and to keep asking questions for it. Take a day of history, folks. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Um, thanks, Clive. That's, um, to me, that's food for thought too, because I certainly um, will be adding that to my um, history taking. And um, Kate, we've got um, a couple of minutes to give you the opportunity to 
give us yeah, a, I, another I, final I just, message. I just encourage people to, yes, develop skills. There's some very good resources out there. The Gambling Impact Society has developed a specific resource for frontline staff, uh, for helping professionals and financial counsellors, and really um, take over an opportunity for training. This is a hidden issue. We need to encourage people to put their hand up, and when they do, make sure that those who are uh, the recipients of that request and know how to respond and also refer on and basically create safety for people to be able to say, I'm having difficulty in this area. It's out there, it's common, and we need to um, be building our skill base for that. Thank you. And I'd like to, to now take um, a moment to to say thank you to our panel members and to, I guess, in, in summing up to, to say how much I've learnt personally and I hope that as, the, um, as participants you've also learnt from the, the range of perspectives that we've had and the key messages that will help us and I certainly remember that to ask about gambling given the hidden nature of this and the impact that it has and, the, and if I go even further the risk that it places people at in their future. So as we proceed to the um, finish of this webinar, can I ask each of you to complete the exit survey when you log out or before you log out? It appears on your screen after the session closes. We're really interested in your feedback and that helps us in our future planning. Please remember that you'll get a certificate of attendance and that's issued within two weeks. And you'll also be sent a link to the online resources that are associated with this webinar. I'd um, like you also to keep a, an eye out for upcoming webinars. The next one's on responding to and treating post-traumatic stress disorder. And we have one coming up on um, caring for young people with gender dysphoria. If you're not part of a special interest network, um, I'd encourage you to think about setting up one if there isn't one in your area. And I understand that Mental Health Professional Network currently supports 380 networks around Australia. So these give you the opportunity to connect with people. Now finally, before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you to everyone for your participation this evening. Thank you.